most of us, so I, I think we're in pretty good shape. Um, so I just want to remind everybody that the task of the building committee is to review the needs assessment report, to determine priorities, to determine the size and scope of the future building project and bond, and then to eventually make a recommendation to the school board. So just to keep um, to keep that task in mind. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to James and. Um, I believe that we're going to hear some options tonight um, yes. and uh, possibilities. <coughs> Great. Well, thank you all for coming. I really appreciate it. I know it's a busy Tuesday on Election Day. A lot of traffic going around here. Um, uh, what Donna said was very accurate. What we're going to do is we have two options as far as um, sort of phase building plans between over the next 10 years or so. Um, based on the feedback that we've received at the previous building meeting meetings, folks wanted to see, you know, what does a build plan, a potential build plan look like? Uh, so we analyzed two different options that we're going to present here tonight. So here with us tonight, um, you recognize myself, Kaylin Colby, uh, Julia Tate, also Scott Simons from Scott Simons Architects tonight. And uh, we're here, obviously, to answer any questions and move uh, the discussion along in, in the direction that we would like to go. So, School renovation and phasing options. Before I, I, I dive complete, uh, completely into this, outlining the, our, from our perspective the next few meetings, this meeting, we're, again, we're looking at discussing what was said on the agenda, we're looking at two potential build plans, the renovation plans for the schools on this campus. Um, the information that folks have requested last or two weeks ago with regard to energy costs, current maintenance, um, maintenance finance that is, that's currently being expended. We're going to have that information next month at the December meeting. We want to make sure that we go through, uh, analyze the data. There was a request for pie charts and graphing of the data, and uh, that's what we're going to be providing next month. And at the uh, January meeting, will be sort of a culmination of all the information that we've gone over thus far, um, a rec a, a, uh, based on the feedback and the opinions of the group here, um, which build option would be best recommended or path forward if neither of these options or a third option or a fourth option. Um, we'll include that as an addendum with the needs assessment report. That way when you have the needs assessment, there will be an additional appendix in the back basically cataloging all of our efforts for the last few months. So getting into it, uh, catching up on what we were uh, discussing last time, um, one, again, one of, our favorite, one of our favorite charts here is just sort of, you know, charting the lifelong, the le longevity of a building and our assessment of where the high school and the Pond Cove Middle School facilities are at this time. Um, again, the high school and Pond Cove Middle School, they've been very well maintained by the Cape Elizabeth facility staff, and that's a tribute to the efforts that you folks are putting into your buildings. They're just getting very old, and the maintenance costs to upkeep these facilities are getting higher and higher and higher. Um, so, based on our analysis, we feel that the Pond Cove Middle School may be closer to um, its, the buildings may be closer to its end of life than the high school. Um, and looking at this is just again just another uh, Google image of the slide. Uh, we can actually go to the next next one. So, option one. And in both of these options, uh, it's going to be a, a uh, there are three parts to each one, uh, and these two items, the SRF applications and sort of general renovations, we understand that those are more likely than not to take place regardless of which option that, that goes forward. So we have the SRF applications that we have submitted. Um, state authorization of the SRF projects in February of 2020. Uh, between March 2020 and June 2020, uh, the design of the SRF projects, per the discussion that we had earlier, since the total amount of money that we're seeking is under $1 million, it doesn't have to match up with the bond vote schedule, and those can get started right away. Um, so what, if, if it were to be, again, this is um, assuming that um, each, one, each uh, item on this list goes through without, without, any, uh, without any issue, um, in March of 2020 through June 2020, it would be the design of the SRF projects. And a lot of the design has been done already in the data sheets and in the applications, but that needs to be placed into actual construction drawings in order for a contractor to bid and then build off of them. So the design for the FR SRF projects would take place between March 2020 and June 2020. 
Uh, then you have June 2020 through August 2020 would be your, your standard bid cycle, two, three months for the SRF projects. And then between August 2020 and July 2021, that is the build window for construction. Again, we're not limited to the bond cycle of when this, these projects can be, or, can be authorized. So uh, looking at this, it gives us a lot more time for a contractor to phase themselves in such a way that it can uh, minimize the disruption to the students at all the schools. Because again, we're looking at night work, weekend work, potentially over holidays. And those numbers were factored into the costs that we included into the applications for the State of Maine SRF program. The next one is uh, general renovations, um, starting in June 2020 with, uh, with, the, with bond approval, or with the new school budget approval, I should say. Um, looking at a Pond Cove Middle School security renovation, uh, high school security and potential flooring uh, renovation as well. Again, removing the VCT uh, from, from the buildings. Um, between June 2020 and February 2021 will be the design of these of these renovations because we need to have make sure that we have time to speak with the users again as we go forward with renovations and potential changes to the facilities. We want to make sure that matches your vision of what's going forward in these projects. Uh, March 2021 through May, that's again your standard two to three month bidding cycle for contractors to proceed uh, and pursue the work. And then from June 2021 through December 2021, that's your construction cycle. Um, and again, I'll, I'll, I'll caveat all of this saying that these dates aren't, obviously, they aren't set in stone. It's just an example of a potential path that we, that we could take. Um, so who want to jump to the next slide, please, Julia? <coughs> so option number one, and the next several slides are going to talk about just this option. Um, a new elementary school. So in March of 2020 through June 2020 starts the architectural, in architectural engineer interviews for each project. Um, uh, to standard with, with public money and with projects of this nature, typically you have to go out to bid on these. Uh, from at June 2020, that's your budget vote for 25% schematic design for pricing. Now in order to come up with an actual accurate cost of what a potential new building would look like, there has to be a level of design and study done in order to get to that point. And the standard throughout our industry is 25%, between 20 and 30%. Uh, so we understand based on this, um, it would be either it would be a bond or through the or through the normal budget of the school department, 25%. From June 2020 to September 2020 would be the design of that 25% schematic design level, we call it. And that would give you the that would give you the um, the as closest to real cost of what this building is going to be. Uh, and then starting in September through November, you have your warrant bond meetings through the public process. Those have to be announced from the town through the town council. And this process it essentially announces to the town that we are going to go forward with this, and we want input and feedback from the public and the citizens from uh, the town, uh, residents from the town. Excuse me. November 2020 uh, is a potential bond vote for the remainder of design and construction. That starts the process of bringing that 25% design level to 100%, we call the CDs or construction documents. Um, once that is approved, November 2020 through June 2021, that's the design of, that's us actually going through and completing design 100% 100, 100% for the new elementary school. Um, June 2021 through August 2021, again, the three-month bid cycle. Uh, and the construction cycle, we're anticipating because of a project of this scale and going through the year, obviously you can't tear down a school or build a school right in the middle of, of, of where classes are taking place. Um, the construction cycle, we factored in approximately 18 months or so between September 21 and January 2023. And then from January 2023 20, to June 2023, you would tear down and demolish portions of the existing building over there at the Pond Cove sections. This, um, this actually, go back one, Julie, real quick. Uh, here, when they say construction cycle, January 2026, and then 2026, you tear down Pond Cove, um, that anticipates, you know, you want to get folks into the new school right away. So, there could potentially there would be a um, uh, shifting between winter break from the old school to the new school. Obviously, if that doesn't work with your current process or curriculum, cur curriculum excuse me, um, that would get pushed to June. You would leave the building upright until that point and then transition in the following year. So this, again, 
we're just looking to give options, and we're looking, we'll be looking for feedback tonight to discuss that. Uh, next slide, please. <laughs> so after the new uh, elementary school, we look at the new middle school. Again, proceeding along March 2023 through June 2023. Again, AE interviews for the project. June 2023 is a budget vote for 25% schematic design. I think we're seeing the pattern here. Um, June through September, your design of the 25% schematic design, that'll tell you again how much is this building actually going to cost with relative certainty. Um, September 2023 to 2020, excuse me, September to November, your bond, warrant, public meetings, your, two, your vote in t November of 2023 is your bond vote for the remainder of design and the construction, that's 100% of your construction documents. And as you go through, it's similar to the construction and build cycle of the elementary school in the previous slide. So we would design the, um, the new middle school between November 2023 and June 2024. The bidding cycle would be after that into August of 24. Your construction cycle would begin in September of 2024 through January 2026. Uh, and a lot of this construction can take place while school is in operation because this is going to be on a different site. If they look out the window, yes, they're going to see a bunch of ex excavators and trucks and mobilization of all the construction folks there. But the, we're, the idea is to try to minimize as much as possible any disruption uh, to the students. And then after, after construction, again, we anticipated a, if you wanted to do a winter break switch over during, between Christmas and the new year when you start up again, um, the December holiday season, excuse me, uh, you would switch basically bring everything over to the new school and between January and June 2026 you would tear down the remainder of the uh, middle school and address the reno any renovations you want for the 1934 build uh, historical building. We're anticipating that because of the historical nature of the 1934 building you would want to keep that there. Um, it's, it's a beautiful little building and uh, it would be a shame for it to go away so the idea would be to move all the building utilities over to that structure and maintain that as either uh, maybe a new home for the school department or uh, municipal services or some other, some other building that's owned and facilitated and operated by the town. Go to the next one, please. Uh, and the last, looking at the new high school, um, again, March through June, again, 2026, A interviews for the project, you have your vote, or uh, your budget vote. Uh, in June 2026, 20, start the schematic design level again, uh, going through your warrant, your public bond meetings, your bond vote in November of 26. Um, again, we're starting to see the pattern here of the cycle that we're looking at. Like, uh, everything was really starting uh, in November. Um, construction cycle, and then January 2029 through June 2029, if you do a swap over from the old school to the new school, during that time, you could tear down, demolish existing, the existing high school. Obviously, there would have to be uh, renovation plans to save the pool, the gym, as its own separate community building, uh, owned and operated by the town, and you would restore athletic fields. Uh, and this, in any of these options that we'll get to, uh, it's, it's important to point out that there will be one, maybe two of the athletic fields on the site that will be temporarily unavailable because either we'll be building a school there, which we'll see in the next slides, um, or it'll be a contractor lay down area. And what that means is they need to bring in their job trailers, they need to know where to store equipment. When they have new mechanical pieces of equipment that go on your rooftop come in a week earlier, so they need to lay down that equipment somewhere. Um, so there will be some temporary relocations for athletic fields that I know it was a potential discussion of if you wanted to converting uh, Gullcrest into a temporary athletic field or going to uh, another municipality for it. The general notes on this, this takes place over nine to ten years or so, uh, providing three brand new separate school buildings. Uh, this would involve three municipal bonds and each of the bonds would, would include the, um, the final design fee, the construction of the new building, and then renovations for the other buildings that would have to be affected by this as well. Uh, for instance, with the elementary school building, tearing down the Pond Cove section of that building while maintaining the middle school uh, portion of that facility, that'll have to be done on our construction level plans to indicate to the contractor what they're going to do. Um, and as I just stated, uh, temporary relocation to other athletic fields, potentially constructing a new athletic field at Gulf Press. Again, I know this, these are just ideas that were thrown out there, um, seeing what's available. Uh, but the one important thing is no portable or temporary classrooms. Um, and we feel that's, 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 uh, that's important. 
go to the next one, please. Um, <coughs> yes, it's, does everybody can see this a little bit better? <clears throat> so we have the current site here, um, that sort of phase, stage zero. And do you want to talk more about this, Sheriff? Yeah, so, so the next few slides are actually just a summary of what James has just gone over in more detail just to give you a graphic representation um, of, of just some potential locations and the sequencing of how the construction phasing would work. So um, on this side you have a timeline so you'll sort of see that build out um, which correlates to all of the notes that James just gave. And then. So the first phase would be the, in the design and build of the new elementary school uh, in this particular case, we're suggesting uh, very loosely that it could be here. Again, this is just diagrammatic, so this in no way, shape, or form um, actually indicates square footage, size, anything like that. And these diagrams also aren't going to be taken into um, consideration contract right now at this point in time, just so you're aware of that. Um, so we're, we're also pointing out the recommendation, too, for the renovations in the existing high school, and then also that the security upgrades we made to be existing elementary and middle school as it's going to continue to be in use. So going to the next slide, this, this work is done, the new elementary school is done, and so we've moved on to the phase where the new middle school is being constructed, um, and although they are, you know, in this uh, proposal separate buildings, we imagine they would still be close to one another on the site. So last but not least, uh, we're anticipating once these buildings come down, potentially we could site the new high school over here. Again, this is just one potential configuration. There are a lot of different options in terms of siting um, that could work as <coughs> sequencing. This is just one example. Um, and so in the last phase, again, where James talked about reclaiming some of that field space, the old high school comes down and all three of the new schools are completed. And again, the important thing that Julia mentioned here is that these are just proposed locations. You know, you have you have a set amount of green space in this property which you've maxed out properly, and it's essentially looking at it as a big puzzle piece. Where does this piece go to go here? Where does this go to go here? There are a multitude of different options that could be done with this layout, but this is just one. The most important thing is is just looking at the schedule and the phase build out of all three of these schools and how this would take place over the next 10 or so years. Um, jump to the next one. So this is option two. Again, similar, you have your SRF funds. Those have been submitted. That ball is, that ball is rolling at this point. Um, with the general renovations, <coughs> similar to before, uh, you have some security renovation, the high school security and flooring, BC removal uh, renovation as well. Um, and on these, uh, the next slide here, looking at the new height, this replaces the new, uh, excuse me, this replaces the high school first. We wouldn't replace the new high school first. That doesn't make any sense. Uh, so it begins with the new high school, March 2020 through June 2020. Again, AE interviews for projects. June 2020, you start, you have a budget vote for 25% schematic design. And again, we're very familiar. We keep in the same pattern for build out for the rest, of, for, all these fo uh, for all these projects. Um, going down here, again, in January 2023, and that's, this is what makes the renovations at the, high, the existing high school, I'll say, important, uh, transition students to the new high school and transition K through 8 from Pond Cove Middle School to the newly renovated existing high school. Now, one point, one portion, uh, one point to note about this is that um, in the beginning, looking at the maintenance curve, the high school still has a decent amount of life left in that building. Um, and then there, there are a lot of facilities there that would really benefit the K through 8 student population. For one instance, uh, looking at Ms. Ramsey's issue with moving all the timpani and everything from the middle school over to the high school, if she were to have her class have the full, um, have the full use of the auditorium and the band room and everything else at the high school, I would imagine it would be a, a significant upgrade to what your current facilities are. Um, obviously, renovations would take place and to, and to see how that would go, but if you're already performing over there, this, again, this is just one example, if you're already there, then you don't have to worry about moving all of your equipment up and down the undulations of the campus to another school. Um, next slide, thank you. And then <clears throat> the new high school continued from January 2023 to 
June 2023, you tear down, demolish the existing uh, middle school, renovate the 1934 building, historical building. And when I say existing middle school, it's the middle school and the Pond Hope as well, because all of those folks will be over at the existing high school, the new K through 8 building. Um, uh, next slide, please. With this option, now, new K through 8 school, we're saying that starts in March 2023. That's not necessarily has to be that start date. We're just showing how sequentially, if you wanted to take this route, this is how it would look. Um, theoretically, this March 2023 date for designing a new K through 8 school could be pushed out a few years because now you have a newly renovated high school. Um, your, maintenance, your maintenance bills are still there, but they would be less because you're renovating, you're working on a new um, uh, removing all the VCT flooring so you don't have to polish that every year. You just go to polish concrete on the floors. Upgrading your mechanical HVAC systems. Uh, one great benefit to the existing high school is that it has several portions of the school are already on grade. And uh, correct me from, from Rob Scott and Julia, but uh, is it kindergarten through second grade that needs to be single floor? Um, so K through two has to be on a single floor building. That's why Pond Cove is the way it is because we can't um, state mandates, you can't have kindergarten kids going up two, three flights of stairs every day. Um, that would be awful for those poor little guys. And um, so going through a new K through eight school would look similar to this, the same setup as previous. Um, you have your warrant, your bond, your design meetings, you have your design, you have your 100% construction documents on a November vote, um, and you have your September to January 2026 if we went straight into it afterwards, but that could be any day five, ten years down the line. Uh, your construction cycle, the tear down, demolish the existing high school, again saving the pool and gym for community building, and you restore athletic fields to that area. And not necessarily you have to get rid of the school out as well. There's the study that can be done if you want to reuse the building for municipal services. It could be a town building, a community building. Um, there are a lot of different options that you can use to, to revitalize and utilize that building. It doesn't necessarily have to be taken down. Um, the general notes on this, if you pursued everything altogether, it would take place over six to seven years. However, the K, as I said, the K through eight school schedule could be pushed back based on renovations, prolonging the end of life for the existing high school. Because uh, we feel that there's at least a good 10 years or so left in that building before you need to have this discussion again. You're looking at two major municipal bonds. Uh, temp again, temporary removal of some athletic fields, relocation to other athletic fields, or constructing a new one at Gulf Press. Again, just utilizing the options that are out there. Uh, and no, again, very important, no portable or temporary classrooms. Uh, what's attractive about this one is that, again, with two municipal bonds, you have the one large bond to A, renovate, renovate the old high school, the design to include the new high school, and the renovation teardown of the middle school and Pond Cove. That's all together in one, <laughs> one bond and one vote. If you want to pursue the K-3 building, that would be on your timeline afterwards, but that would be the, that would be the build plan that would work best. Um, and Julie, would you like to talk about the phasing of this one as well? So again, just starting with the same existing conditions in terms of the phase plan. Um, slide. So again, taking into consideration the conversation or the, the point that was brought up at the last time we met that it would be really nice for the new buildings to have visibility from the main road, these put in this scenario, the new high school in this location, again, renovation work to the existing high school and the security um, upgrades for the existing elementary and middle school as it continues to be occupied. And then in this scenario, we have anticipated um, as soon as the uh, the K through eight are relocated to the existing high school, as the new high school is occupied, all of this is demolished, and they begin construction on the new elementary school wing and middle school wing to effectively make a new K through eight, still attached to the original 1934 building. In this case, uh, we thought that even though you know this was desirable, there was also something very desirable about maintaining the presence on this side street and really maintaining that walkability um, to the neighborhoods and connections to the surrounding neighborhoods there. And then, again, uh, the moment where all the new schools are completed and you're regaining your fields. Um, in this case, we've actually highlighted the, exist the, the maintenance of the existing community pool and gym down here, although 
I think that this diagram brings up a, a really good question about um, the connection of this facility to the, the rest of the campus and the site. You know, that would definitely be looked at and explored in, in planning studies and schematic design when the project gets to that point. And again, one, one point to note, we're, we're not showing traffic loops, we're not, we're not showing the bus routes, that's, that's part of the 25% design study that will actually map everything out. We study the soils, we see what's underneath, what the load is, how much fill we need to bring in to cover the undulations that's in the center area here, because as you all know, it sort of steps down as you go in from one field to the other. Um, one interesting uh, item to note uh, that uh, Julie pointed out, Scott Dyer Road would be really, uh, re really, really nice when you have uh, the 1934 building. Say if that were to become a new school department building, and on either side you have your K through, you have your um, your elementary school and your middle school on the other side, and sort of one one front face in Scott Dyer Road, and you have all the f athletic fields and everything, and the new playground that you have there as well. Um, maintaining that. There would be a reconfiguration of the roads, the traffic going in and out, as I said, but uh, that would be developed and enhanced as, as design would move forward. Um, so those are the two options that we've, that we've sort of come up with that we feel would be best to A, get, um, <coughs> provide the needs for you folks as far as renovating the existing schools in place, uh, as well as, you know, what's the plan for a new facility. Um, one uh, an additional item I'll note is that each of these options involve a security renovation at the Pond Cove and Middle School. So you're addressing those issues immediately and not waiting any longer to prolong that. Obviously, it would be temporary before the uh, a new facility would be built or the students would move to another building. But those items are being are being addressed with these two plans. Um, so with that, um, we'd love to open up questions. Comments. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. We have actually some additional things as well. My, my apologies. So Julie's going to take us through uh, some uh, maintenance items that we've uh, identified as well. Some of this will be a recap of what you've seen before in terms of some of the existing uh, annual maintenance costs specific to the VCT, which we've mentioned several times. Uh, just over one and a quarter million dollars for all three schools every single. Um, so, on the next slide, I think we again just have the summary that um, Prairie was kind enough to provide, which really illustrates well that even though the VCT has a low first cost over years, with the consideration of all the maintenance costs, it actually has a much higher life cycle cost overall than a lot of other materials. Um, so, you hear, see on here carpet tile, for instance. Um, and other vinyl composite flooring and ceramic tile. So going to the next slide, we've actually, um, two materials that we've been discussing are polished concrete, which would actually mean removing the existing VCT and polishing the existing concrete subfloors, patching and polishing the existing concrete subfloors below, um, which we think is an interesting option for this particular school. Uh, really just because you're looking for a relatively short lifespan and so once you uncover it you should know that it's not going to be perfect, ideal, um, beautiful polished concrete. You're probably going to see some discoloration, not so much the seams, some of the transitions. Um, but all things considered, it's definitely going to get you through uh, those last 10 or 15 years. See, another product that we've been discussing is a quartz tile product. and so. We're still pulling together some of the data, but sorry, this is a little bit hard to, to see, but so the cost of the removal of the existing VCT is estimated to be about $1.50 per square foot, and then the cost to do the polished concrete finish is also $1.50 per square foot. Uh, and then the quartz tile is a little bit more expensive. It's $4.22 uh, installed in addition to the $1.50 to remove. We're still trying to get some information on what the actual costs for maintenance are per year. Um, but information that we have from the quartz tile manufacturer indicates that the quartz tile is 55% less than the VCT over a 10 year period. So you're already going to be that much better off from a maintenance standpoint. Um, so it's really just a matter of doing the math to see you know, whether or not 
the polished concrete versus the quartz tile. And, and we estimate that the polished concrete um, at worst will be, or yeah, at worst will be comparable, if not better, than the quartz tile in terms of the uh, annual maintenance costs. So it's it's really just sort of about crunching the numbers and determining determining which is going to be best um, once you determine what your plans are going forward for reusing existing buildings. Um, and then this diagram, again, to speak to some of the questions that have been brought up regarding the sustainability and the performance of the existing building envelope versus a new building envelope. So this example is borrowed from another architect and it um, really was <coughs> developed more towards residential, but the principles still apply. So it starts here with your older buildings, a oh, typical construction now, a building that would follow the Energy Star guidelines only. Um, and then this is probably comparable to building code. And then you step above the threshold of a passive house type construction. And so passive house is really about um, high performance and a tight thermal envelope, triple pane windows. Um, and then once you, you cross over the line there, you start to get into the net zero conversation. So these little orange panels here represent solar, which we know is being discussed and, and you know is of great interest to many of those on the sustainability committee. Um, so the numbers are slightly lower for uh, educational construction type versus residential. So this is saying approximately 90% um, energy reduction for a passive house. We're seeing closer to 80, um, but still it's a significant savings over what you are currently seeing for your maintenance and operations costs. And then of course net zero, um, you would look to balance that out with things <coughs> like solar arrays. So we were hoping that this graphic sort of helped you um, have an understanding, just very relatively, of where you can be in this realm versus where you might be in the home. I think uh, I think Scott, you go back to the previous slide. Um, again, I just wanted to uh, reiterate that at the previous meeting there were a whole bunch of financial numbers and, uh, and uh, things that people were asking for. We're still digging those up. Our hope is to have them for you to digest here within just a little bit. Um, so uh, I, I wanted to touch on this slide. Um, Austin Smith at the last meeting made a really good, um, made a, a really good, no, 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 it's no, the, uh, the one you're on. Um, yeah. Made a really good uh, speech about you folks have done such a good job of taking care of your building, and they're, you're probably going to find in the community an argument of, oh, Cape kids are successful coming out of these school, out of the school system, and um, you know why should we, why should we invest money in the building? And there's a, there's a. There's a sense of like, should we be throwing a lot of money at VCT every year, and should we be pumping energy out the windows every year? There's a there's a social piece that you should that we should try to get out to the community. There's a there's some there's a message there, and Julia spoke to it. Is we're back here with an old building. You folks have done a great job taking care of it, but it is still an older building. Um, and how many? If people have heard of Passive House or know a little bit about it? Raise your hands. Okay. Um, <clears throat> my wife and I built uh, three years ago in Cape, and uh, we built, uh, there's, there's another movement out, the Passive House has some really passionate people. There's another movement out called Good Enough House, and it's, it's sort of passive light, you know? <laughs> a third less tree hugging than your regular, uh, uh, tree. anyway. What it does is you save the principles. We built a house with um, uh, R25 under the slab, R45 in the walls, double stud wall system, and R60 overhead. When we turn on the oven to warm up dinner or cook something, our whole house, the major living area of the house stays warm for a day and a half. You can have that at your school, and it will pay back. It does, it does, have, a big, it does have a larger first cost. Um, but there are ways around that as well. There's, there's wonderful, wonderful uh, ways to save money on that. Um, <clears throat> let me just give you one example of what we did. 
which is still commercially available, a lot of developers are doing it now, is when they take down a huge mall down south, they go in and they cut the three inch insulation, basically blue board styrofoam insulation, out of the roofs. You can buy it for pennies on the dollar, that's what we did. We bought a truckload of it. We put it under our slab, R25, we put it in the walls, we put some of it in the overhead with, with some uh, rock, rock salt, rock wool insulation and some other, uh, some other insulations to match it up. There are those types of um, construction means available to you as you go forward, and part of it will be educating the community on why we should do this. Um, so I uh, just wanted to say a little bit of something about the general renovations. As you move forward in, in your work, you're probably going to be questioned, why should we do any renovations to the schools? Um, the high school still has 10 plus years left in it. Um, there are some security concerns, and you saw the schedule that James laid out. Regardless of what you do to get a new school going, you probably we are going to need to do something to these schools to keep them going. Um, one, to keep them safe, and two, to keep them as, as energy efficient as they can be. And as Julia laid out, there may actually be some savings to be had in doing things like taking up the VCT and going with a, with a, a polished concrete. Um, Next thing is uh, um, the locations. Um, I, would, I would recommend that do exactly as, as Julia and Scott laid out tonight, which is in your recommendations, I don't think you have to say, oh, put the building here, it has to be this big and it has to look like this. I think moreover the community is looking for you to say, yeah, this is a good idea, we like this. In a more in-depth study that James recommended with another group of People, maybe it's yourself continuing on, I don't know what that would look like, to say, hey, do you want the school to look like this, a little more modern? Do you want it to face this street? Those are detailed decisions that can come down the road. And the last thing I wanted to cover was sort of what we had envisioned as our deliverables to you uh, as a committee, so you can say, we recommend this back to, um, back to Dr. Wolfram. And those, as James, I think, has been covering is um, one is the build plan, which is largely the schedule that's laid out. Do you, do you think it should be a two bond vote or a three bond vote or a no bond vote, whatever you'd like, but we will help you put those, deliver those graphics together to support that. What James put up there and covered tonight um, was a notional. Take that, massage it, talk amongst yourselves and say, hey, we like this. That's the first deliverable. Um, the second would be sort of, I call it a spend plan or a bond plan is if you think it should be done over six to eight years with two bonds or over ten years with you know with three bonds there are advantages and disadvantages to both or again one bond whatever you folks would like we'll support you with all the graphics you want um, and so please ask questions uh, we're putting out things we're providing some of our knowledge which is standard construction and design schedules um, things uh, things we know are going to take a certain number of months and we can help you with that so um, I think those two things the schedule and the build plan I think are deliverables that we want to provide to you so you can say sort of ratify them but they, they we want them to be yours so, um, thank you thanks you uh, as, as stated we're again we're talking about notional schedule here Next month, we're going to have more, more data to back up what we brought tonight. Um, just assembling that information uh, over the past two weeks, there's more in-depth analysis that we want to come up with, more, more again, high charts, data that was requested at the first building committee meeting. Uh, we don't want to rush that. Uh, we, have meetings to, we have meetings built into the schedule to address those. So tonight, we wanted to talk about, again, the notional schedule. Um, so I suppose with that, does anyone have any questions? Comments, criticisms. Yes. Oh, I have a question. I feel like we've gone from zero to three hundred buildings that are probably north of a hundred million dollars. When we have an assessment that says all of the buildings are satisfactory for the purposes, and I think everyone would acknowledge there needs to be a lot of stuff done. And so my question would be looking at something that I would call option three, which would be what would it take 
if we've got three satisfactory buildings, what would it take to make those buildings more energy efficient, safer with the entryway for the middle school? What would it take to do the things that we really need to do but continue to use those buildings? Because it seems to me that the ultimate environmental sustainability is to stay in the footprint that you're in and not be taking down trees and making stuff and filling landfills with buildings that are, in your view, satisfactory. So I personally would like to see an option three that looks at those three buildings and what we need to do to get those. And I, and I confess, I'm old enough to have lived through children in portables in the 1990s when in the middle school. And those are inconvenient, but they work. And I don't think that um, we should just ignore that. I don't know how we could sell to the community three new buildings if we haven't looked at what it would take to fix and modernize and make energy efficient and use all that roof space for solar as, as a third alternative. So that's a comment that I have. Oh, cool. oh, <laughs> Marianne, thank you for that perspective. I think to add on to that, though, one of the one of the critical questions to be answered in that scenario is what, how much more life do we ultimately achieve with that investment? Um, because what I think I was personally surprised by at our first meeting was the degree to which the clock on that timeline, that longitudinal timeline of building lifespan doesn't necessarily reset to zero with some of the, the types of renovations we're talking about. So that unless we were discussing the sort of full-scale building renovation like we did with the library, where that's effectively, for all intents and purposes, a new building now, and, and you have set the clock back to zero, I, I think for this group to make any kind of effective evaluation, it's going to need to understand well, we can spend this amount of money to make the kind of improvements and enhancements that you're talking about, but do so with eyes wide open to the fact that it only gets us this further down the timeline. And, and until we, I think, can weigh those things, I, I don't know. Or it may only get us that far, or it may get us much farther. But yeah. we, don't, we don't know. And that's what I'm saying is that it seems to me that there's a lot of information we don't have. Yeah. And we're only supposedly two meetings away from making a recommendation. Mm -hmm. uh, and we're talking about keeping the oldest part of all of the facilities, the middle school, because it looks great and it's a beautiful building. So I sort of come back to, well, then why not make it a beautiful school again with that facade? But and then the last thing I was just going to say to that point, and I, I think information that both Perry and the team are still working to pull is the blind spot that we have on what the total cost of operation for all of these buildings is and what that continued cost of operation will be under any of the scenarios that are outlined. Um, so I think, I think what we've seen here is a, a good job in just framing up relative time that it would take to do work and to plan and things like that, but I think we're still very blind to comparative options around uh, return on that investment. So. No, but it's okay. Uh, I can I was going to say that I uh, think two main responses to your question is our, I agree with you that we should probably have a presentation that the public can see to show them what that investment would look like. Um, because you're right, there are a lot of questions. Why can't we just tear this thing down to the bones and put it back together? Um, but then to that point, um, at some point your house, our homes, get so old that taking it all back and bringing it all up again 
you're still not going to get all the way there to um, to a place where you have the R value that you really want and you have all the systems that you really want. Um, Perry, um, Perry made a really great presentation about the, I would call it the shape factor of the existing schools, which you have a slab on grade, so you have the cold coming in along the slab, so the first four feet in from the outside edge and the winter is freezing. Um, you have this long one-story building where the heat just goes up and goes through the roof instead of a, a more modern building would have a more sort of a more multi-story factor so that you can serve on heat and you have less square footage to the outside than you do uh, your ratio, excuse me, let me get back up. The ratio of, of floor square feet to outside square, square feet is much different on a more modern building. Um, I could use another example of when your car is 15 years old, do you do the frame off restoration? Do you go in and buy what they call a target motor, which is a brand new reconditioned motor, and you put it all back together, but the seats are still old and uncomfortable and not helping your back, and the heating system doesn't quite get you there in that rebuilt car? Yeah, sure, you might jump in and drive to California and still and feel confident that it will get you there, but it doesn't have all the new safety stuff. The buildings suffer from a height restriction where presentations. Um, the presentations are hard, running HVAC duct is going to be complicated in a new modern HVAC system. So, yes, I, I agree that we should, because um, if you're asking the question, somebody else is going to ask the question, should we do this? And we should present what you would get for that investment. I would argue that for not a lot more, you're going to wind up with more green space on this site buildings that will truly go for another 50 or 60 years before you have to have this committee again. Um, and again, this based on the needs assessment that we performed, we show the high school has you know, 10, 10, 12 years left in it, and we show that Pondfield Middle School has even less than that. Um, so, I'm sorry, that was rather long-winded, but... Um, so, my question or comment, it's probably more of a comment, and I kind of wish Perry was here, because one thing... <laughs> and then also, I don't remember your name. Derek. Derek. So at the last meeting, um, Perry and Derek both addressed something that was really crystallizing in my mind, which I think the committee has to think about, which is, what do we want our buildings to be able to do, and can simply renovating them do that? And the preliminary answer is no. So I appreciate that we're already like starting to think about what we really want to do and be able to do because even, you know, we, if we don't change the footprint of that high school, we're, we're never going to be able to get, you know, the heating and the R value and anything because it's impossible. Um, and I will make a plug for having a student at the high school said, all we really want is it to be a, like a relatively similar temperature throughout the building. <laughs> Can it please just not be freezing here and hot here? And I don't, you know, we can't do that in that building. But, um, so I think that's one of the things we really have to think about. What do we want these buildings to be able to do? Is it even possible for us to get there with the existing building? what is the investment that it would take to even get there and and as Jamie said how far back does that really set the clock I think one more one more point to renovating the existing buildings that is sort of a, a mark against them is you would have to move students and teachers into some type of temporary mm -hmm. teaching arrangement and all every dollar you spend heating those renting the trailers dealing with weird you know parking and stuff is a dollar that you're not spending on the school itself. And I would venture a guess that it, that number is probably somewhere between 10 and 25% of the cost during during the time that those trailers are occupied. Um, yes, uh, so many schools throughout the state of Maine, so many people, and my peers and my contemporaries all spent time in temporary trailers. It was a great move to get the students into better places than, than they were. Um, but there's, there's room on this site to not have to do that and pump every dollar that we can possibly put into something good. So it's, it's not that it can't be done, it's just, is that the wisest use of our, of our money?
Go ahead. I just wanted to add one more dimension to the conversation, and that is that a, a 1960 or 1970 school is designed for a different learning model and teaching model. So the 21st century learning and teaching models are vastly different. We don't have double-loaded quarters. We don't line the kids up in, in uh, desks in the classrooms. And these classrooms and all of the schools are really an old model and don't allow the flexibility that the teachers are working with their learning models now as a way of I mean, breakout groups and different ways of rearranging the furniture and things like that and lots of flexibility in the classrooms. So that's another, that's another component of the decision that it's not, you know, we can renovate them and we can make them more energy efficient. We can do better lighting, we can do better heating and better flooring and all of, the, all of those things that we, that we can't structurally, if, if we're going to try and make any use of those buildings, we're going to try and save the structure. And that structure is based on a 19th, 20th century teaching and learning model, not a 21st century. So that's, that's another, it's a multiple variable equation. Um, so in that, in the analysis of it, as a, for the reuse of those facilities, we should also include that as one of the variables. <coughs> I just, I just want to add, since we didn't do introductions, um, is, uh, your name is Scott Simons yes. from Simon Architects. Scott Simon Architects. So since we didn't do introductions, people may not know. I got more of a, was thinking the same thing that Scott was. We spent the morning, this morning, as teachers. Um, meeting and um, coming up with ideas to really flesh out some of the board's new goals. Um, not new goals, but, but, but certainly they've made a, an initiative to, to rewrite some of our broad, broader goals. And I, I felt so uh, good knowing that I was part of this committee because the things that we talked about um, in just about every group of teachers that I was with were really some wonderful innovations and um, and they just seemed so appropriate to what kids, uh, who they are today, and what we might be doing uh, for them in the future. Uh, and so I, I feel like the, the, the ideas put forward have a lot to do with more than brick and mortar, but the way we, the way we teach and learn. Um, and one more, one more thought. Um, again, Caitlin touched upon it with the phasing. Um, to, to really gut these buildings, again, you would have to transfer students out of these facilities and use them in a temporary, basically a separate temporary school, either on the same campus somewhere or elsewhere in town, um, to really go through it. It would be very difficult and challenging to go room by room renovation. We really need to demo everything back to the stud walls. If you want to consider putting uh, photovoltaics on that roof, all of the roof structure needs to be reinforced. Um, one of the issues that we pointed out in the needs assessment report is a section of roof of the high school that can't withstand the current code required snow load. Uh, if it can't require the snow load, it certainly can't support PV array that's going to be put up there, adding that much more uh, weight to the structure. So it would really be a down to the stud renovation where um, not only are you losing the school's functionality for 18 months or more, but that could even be longer than two years if you have to stagger students coming in and out of the facility. Um, but we, we can show, uh, again, with the next meeting, we'll show what the maintenance costs are and the investments are. More, more real and actual numbers once we've had a chance to digest and go through the information we've been provided over the last week or so. Just to follow up on that, um, not simply photovoltaic arrays, but even just increasing the thermal insulation properties of the existing roof um, has very real potential to require an upgrade of the entire roof structure. I think probably four times a year, and this year before you, just before the department, we get asked to go um, help out either a church or a school, and they want to put all kinds of insulation in the roof. And back in the day, the, the, the insulation was not put in, in the roof, so the heat went up and melted the snow off the roof. So believe it or not, they weren't actually designed to hold the snow. So what happens in, this, in the 70s and with the energy crisis, this started to, you saw a whole bunch of buildings start to collapse when people thought they were doing a good thing and throwing in a bunch of insulation snow builds up on the roof and eventually tore the roof off. Sometimes it collapsed, sometimes just weathered the building to death by causing more leaks. Um, again, one more thing to think about. I'll see you.
Uh, I have two questions, and one of them might have been the answer that I, I came late to. I'm sorry, I was out there voting. No worries. Uh, so, I think Julie had mentioned something about taking these things apart and finding the concrete below it and polishing it and all that, and then maybe possibly putting a, a reptiles on them. Can we put reptiles on top of this rather, rather than taking them out? Is that possible? on the location. Correct. There are some locations where the existing floor is actually separating from the subfloor. Um, so you could, but if you just cover those up simply, you could potentially yeah. And they're not the all hazards. concrete, but I'm yeah. sure this floor is not concrete. They might be some less in the wood as well. Yeah. But we could, we could definitely consider that. I don't know from a maintenance standpoint um, how desirable carpet in all of the public traffic, heavy traffic areas will be, but it's certainly a conversation. Yeah. The last, the last meeting we, it was suggesting that uh, it was recommended for soundproof and, and maintenance as well. And I think I asked this question last time, uh, and Jamie can help here. I don't know if, uh, if we are really considering rebuilding the schools, is relocation uh, an option? And I know there's a Cape Elizabeth Land Trust across the street has an option. Can we swap? Can we swap another place uh, in, this, in the town? And can we identify anything that's available within the t for the town or we can acquire? And in my personal opinion, building something off-site, off, off here is much easier if we were to choose that route. And then sell this off and make money off it. So. You bring up a really good point. Um, an advantage of building on a larger site, I think we mentioned this last time, would might give you construction parking, construction lay down, separation from students as a safety. Um, there would be a large construction fence up and everything, but building elsewhere, um, that's a decision that folks, if, if there's lots around that are big enough to support high school and middle school, and other, certainly, certainly you could look at those. Um, I, I don't know if this is a place for personal conjecture, but I love the town that People like you folks and myself as a town resident are building this downtown beautiful library historic town hall having the schools here on a campus seems neat to me in that location this is becoming a one it's becoming a walkable beautiful place um, and I think you know, uh, and it's not that right across the street wouldn't, wouldn't be fine but again that's that's you're the building committee so I think there's the, the cost. Of, there's a big athletic infrastructure around the schools, all the fields, the tracks, everything. There, that's if you moved it, then they would either be remote or you'd have to replace those, and that would be a different calculus too in terms of the cost of the facility. Yeah. Yes. I took a pass at this two or three times over the last week or so, and honestly, it was just overwhelming. I think the pictures, I think you did a really nice job. I thought it was very compelling looking at the conditions of the, of the schools. I went back to the, um, to, the, to the spreadsheets in the back of the report, and you know, you didn't have, I had to kind of add them all up a little bit, but I took all the reds and the yellows and added in the greens for the elementary and the middle school and came up to about you know, twelve point eight million dollars just in fixes that you had you had put on there. And I know there's some qualifications around some of those numbers. Sure. But you know, I thought that that was a really big number. And that does that includes that there are two TVDs, programming improvements, expansion and, and makerspace improvements and then all the other things. So um, my question I had in my, to myself was, uh, you know, are we still going to throw good money after bad if we were to go out and spend $15 million in fixes because we couldn't get, say, the HVAC to work well enough to make it more comfortable? Those are the kinds of things that, uh, that come to mind for me. Um, and the same thing went for the high school. Um, you know, that number is up around, up around, uh, $7.5 million. 
And that excludes a lot of the TBDs that you had in there, which were, you know, program improvement expansions and the science rooms and, and a few other things. Um, so, you know, these are big numbers, even on fixes. So you have to ask yourself, you know, are we, would we be throwing good money after bad and how would we sell that? If you were looking at your home, sir, I'm Kalen, by the way. If you were looking at your home and it was an old two by four stud wall with a you know blanket insulation, tire drywall on the inside, and the rugs were worn, and the, you had an asphalt shingle roof, and the, and the you know the asphalt shingle when it gets tired, all the all the edges of the tile are curved up, and you think oh, I could put all new siding on, I could invest in new windows, redo the floors, maybe sisters go real advanced and sister stud in so every two by four becomes a two by six and I have to move out of my house for three months well or four months while I can do all that when you come back you'd have dumped a ton of money in your house it would be better yes but it still wouldn't be as tight as as the new the new building is you can use that example for your home you can use it for your old car um, thing, things have a life and I think to Scott's point it is really, really important is helping the teachers teach at the most advanced level. Um, all the investment you would dump in with those, those two numbers you mentioned, plus all the other stuff to do the frame-off restoration that was mentioned over here. Plus the swing space. You know, plus the swing, the swing space, space does, the, uh, the mods. Doesn't, doesn't get you to, um, I mean, that's, this is what Scott Simons does. They, they make classrooms for really advanced kinds of teaching that are, are going to propel you into the next century. Scott just brought up a really good point, adding on to everything that's just been said, you know, all of these fixes that you mentioned probably have or do have some relative correlation to this building maintenance chart, you know, so um, money invested will buy you a little bit of time, but, you know, in reality, that money is being invested at this moment, not this moment. So, you know, the, the point that you bring up, you know, how much are we comfortable um, investing in the existing buildings to maintain them as they are for how long um, versus investing that money in new buildings that will ultimately have a longer, you know, will essentially restart this clock for you. Valerie? Yeah, I just wanted to jump in. So I think to, to Marianne's point, though, I think there are very few people who would say, even with a house in that condition, I'm just going to tear it down. I think most people don't view their house that way. So in terms of selling it to the community, um, I think the numbers that we're looking for are important. And it sounds like you guys are working on that, that we kind of need that concrete information to say we've looked at other options. We can give you numbers, and we can say that it's going to be a better investment to rebuild than to yeah, put no, money into renovating. I couldn't agree more. That's why I answered I, I think we need, to set, we need to tell that story, um, we mean building committee and the department moves us forward. Tell that story as, yes, this is an option to you. It has it has several downsides that, that you should really consider strongly. I would also say, you know, that the example of, of your home and choosing to invest in your home is, is actually a very different conversation in terms of being um, your personal choice your own investments, that is very much a labor of love, and I think it's very evident from the maintenance, for, from how well the existing buildings are maintained, that those have over time very much been also a labor of love to some extent. Um, but I think driving the conversation um, in, you know, from really the investment perspective and fiscal responsibility is, is going to be really key. Actually. <laughs> I don't want to dominate the conversation, but um, when we last met, there was some discussion around uh, coming to us, and maybe you're still working on it, with uh, uh, what a broad scope would look like for developing a full master plan uh, under which to work here. Is that still something that's being looked into? Or, um, with regard to the master plan, um, and yes, we had, we had mentioned that, and that is, again, the study of the entire campus here. Yeah. What are the options are? Where could buildings go? Um, we have been, uh, I'll say we've, we've been with you for the past two and a half years, um, and we've, we've been through 
every building, every room. We, we studied this campus very thoroughly. And um, when you're looking at a master plan, that's another around <coughs> eight to nine, nine month effort, um, costing you over, over $100,000 for it. Again, it's another study to tell you essentially what you already know. <coughs> this is your area, here are your building footprints. Um, and yes, we did mention a master plan, however, what it was really needed is just a study of where where buildings could go on the site. I guess then maybe I misinterpreted. So what, and what I would thought it might have yielded was a little bit more of what Marianne was talking about, where um, here's what our plan might look like for the next 40 years for all of these buildings. And it might include this level of renovation at this point, this level of replacement of one or more of the buildings, and then ultimately, 40 years from now, you know, a, a more a sort of rolling and staggered. You know, I, I think one of the challenges, obviously, that we're facing right now, is that the bill is coming due on all potentially all three of these in a relatively um, tight window. And um, so, if if we were to step back and do some some more strategic assessment around, well, while some of that money might be good money after bad. There could potentially be some good after good in one or more of the situations that, that then gets us to a more staggered total campus management plan. Um, and I think, I mean, option one does that a little bit, but in a compressed 10-year cycle, I guess. And so maybe it's just taking option one and figuring how, how long can you stretch that out. So that was one question I had. And I, I don't think that that's an urgent deliverable for even the next meeting, but I, I think it's something that we should continue talking about in terms of not looking at discrete construction projects, but rather what is our you know strategic approach to the total campus. That's number one. Uh, number two, in multiple examples that you guys gave, um, there was discussion about preservation of different whole buildings or parts of buildings. And just for some context and background from the municipal side of things, um, we've had several buildings sort of come available, if you will, um, or you know become unoccupied in town recently that we haven't even had the need for those much smaller buildings. And so I have a hard time envisioning um, uh, an actual need um, for, for both you know, practical use of the building, but then also the absorbed cost that then comes to the municipal side of then having to do the maintenance and upkeep and stuff on a building that, you know, we're effectively then duplicating efforts. But what my big question is, and, and, and not something I expect that you've looked into yet or, or might not even have specific expertise in, but is what is the developable opportunity for buildings that, in, in any of these scenarios, that become unoccupied is there commercial developable opportunity there, whether it be you know turning the existing 1934 building into housing, is it turning the high school into you know an assisted living center? I, you know, any number of different things, but is there are are any of those things viable such that you get to the point where all right, well here's hundred million dollars of investment in new facilities, but that might be offset by some level of recruitment on the sales side. I have no idea. So that's something I think we should also be thinking of. And again, may go back and revert to the first point I made about um, a master plan, and, and maybe that's something that's covered in that. Um, and then uh, the the last thing um, I, I know that we. We haven't been talking a lot about the financial numbers, and, and Andy, I appreciate you, you focusing in on that as well. Um, and I know that you all have had an interest in it. At some point, I think we need to, to have a discussion just around what the threshold of borrowing would be. Um, so there's there's the, the wants of, you know, oh, it'd be great if we could do all this, but then the, you know, we have to measure that against the reality of, of what even even if people were bought into it, and even if people all came to the consensus that this is the right thing to do, what is our level? And, and I know Matt um, and, and you know the business team are going to take a look at that as well. But um, you know there are certain thresholds that we're going to I think bump up against <coughs> around what is our actual maximum borrowing capacity, things like that. So 
not not just on sort of political will or will of the public to do it, but actual versus valuation of the town and things like that. So, uh, so that we're not putting our our bond ratings in jeopardy, and so you know that we're not over leveraged. I will say, you know, right now we're we are actually under leveraged. We do have capacity. We don't have capacity to build three schools, I don't think. But there is there is capacity based on what our current um, lever position is um, to do some borrowing. And we've talked in previous meetings about this being, you know, from a financial standpoint, an advantageous time to do that based on the rate environment and things like that. Um, but a, a serious look at what that total capacity is, I think, is critical so we can then say, well, this is our max budget, basically. What can we do within that max budget and then prioritize all of these different options in one time? That data would be very helpful. Oh, do you have no, 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 no. I've already spoken. That's okay. Well, all right, so I don't know if this is the right venue, but just thinking about it, when you're talking about two buildings, um, if we're looking at building over the schools, do we want to then look at what do those schools look like? Is elementary school going to say K-4? Would it be a K-6 building? Do we, I mean, do we want to look at the way that students are organized? Because that might be two buildings versus three buildings. Mine is a little, it's a little, it's on topic and off topic. It's November 5th, and I was just wondering if Marcy had heard anything yet about the SRRF. Um, no, but I'm going up to the state on Thursday morning, and I'm going to try to get an appointment with Annette to see if we can get some information. Because we were told that we would at least know whether or not we right. made the cut. Um, I did hear that the there were 140 applications. <laughs> New applications right now. Are mm -hmm. those the new? And that's new, new and prior. 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 So, okay. right. so we have, we have 12 of those And we put in 12. So, <laughs> so <laughs> this may have put, you know. If I can add one comment again, looking at the, um, um, the phasing of the schools, and obviously to Jamie and Marianne's point of uh, uh, not doing everything at once. Obviously, we're just providing a notional schedule that if you wanted to, this is how you can proceed in the most important <coughs> With time, with looking at time, if you wanted to go building to building to building. But option two, uh, looking at that, you're utilizing the existing high school through for the K-3 facility. Your K-2 through would be on the grade level, which required by code statement that you have to do that. The rest of three through eight is in the other portions of the building as well, where you're only building one school. And then for the new K-8 building, um, if you were to go with that route, once the high school proceeds through its end of life over the next 10, 12 or so years, that's when you would have the, the study again to say, all right, what would this K-8 building look like? Or is it K-4 through four, and then you'd have six, it would be 5 through 8 here, or K-5 through five and 6 through 8 elsewhere. Um, that would be that study at that point, but looking at three, three schools, two buildings that are both nearing their end of life, one of them a little bit better condition than the other, you don't necessarily want to replace all of them at once as to the point of if you have if you have two homes, you would replace roofs on both of them, they're going to fail at the same time. And instead of you know paying five dollars for your roof, you're paying ten dollars for your roof. Um, and now those taking into account trying to utilize your existing resources that you have here without um, without providing portable or temporary classrooms. Again, there was, these are just two notional schedules, two building options. The, the options are endless of what we could do. Yes, ma'am, please. So, I apologize if I missed something. Has a determination been made that you can actually fit the elementary and the middle school into the high school as a matter of school population? That hasn't been completely studied. However, that is the school building is there, and the one if that were if that were the will or the recommendation, that study would take place. And any renovations done at the high school to address security, the removal of any BCT flooring, would account for that as well. Okay, we need to add we need to add a small portion to the first floor here to accommodate X number of additional students. You would go as part of the 
schematic design process, we would go through, and Scott Simons, and is, is, they're the experts at this, you would go through your occupancy, what your current enrollment is, where are those students going to go, your expanded rooms for capacity, if you were to anticipate an increase or decrease in your enrollment over the next five to 10 years. And that would be the study that would take place there. Um, I do, we do not have an exact answer whether or not it can be done tomorrow, for so instance. Wouldn't we need to know that also in order to know whether option two makes sense? That we would, so we would need to have that information yes. fairly early on. Yes. I don't know if this is like, I just, I just think of like the cafeteria at the high school and then our current cafeteria at the middle school and how we can barely fit our middle school students in and the cafeteria at the high school I believe is smaller and we have four lunches currently going through between Ponco. It's like, like how much of a renovation would that phase two be in the high school to accommodate things like that? Right, and again, can't, can't go into details at this point, but we're trying to, the option of just Going to going you utilizing what you have here. This that building still has life left in it. Interior renovations could be done to prolong that for a little bit longer. And so that way the town doesn't have to suffer the burden of multiple large municipal bonds. Um, so yes, there would have to be interior renovations um, done to that to make sure that the capacity is there to support that stoppage or something. Yeah, I, so I'm the culprit. I'm the one who pushed to put something out there to uh, just get you thinking more about it. So, uh, sorry, because it does bring up, it like turns up all these questions, like does it fit, is it actually, how much does it actually cost? And so I'm just pushing to get this out at this meeting so that we can get a little conversation going, a little feedback, just to get you thinking about different ways to solve the conundrum of all of this facility needs. Um, so I think it's good, even though it's right now feels a little awkward, you don't have answers to a lot of your questions and stuff. We're working very hard on these and these other these questions will help us prepare more for the next meeting as well. But I did want to just say there's there's one portion, there's one thing going on here that um, has changed in the last generation. So I've actually been an architect for more than one generation. Um, and when I started, school buildings were designed for 25 years. They're, that was their useful life. Today we design for 50 years. And there are buildings that are being designed for 75 to 100 years now. That just didn't occur to anybody 35 years ago when I started. And that curve, that red line that goes like that, that was the original life expectancy of the schools that were built 40 years ago. We thought, we can get in the last 25 years, who knows what education is going to be like? Who knows how big the communities are going to be? These were growing at different rates back then. So every time that there's been an investment in the schools, you prolong, you can see the spikes. You prolong the life of the building. When you invest, like you're saying, $12, $20 million, something. yes, we can get another eight or 10 years out of the school like that. But that building was designed for 25 years. So all of those things are just making it last longer. It's eventually going to add that run out of life. So it, it, it definitely trends down. You can never flatten that out for the building that was designed 40 years ago um, with a 25-year life expectancy. And I'm sure that a generation from now, I hope, they'll be saying, oh my gosh, those guys back in 2019, they were only thinking 50 years what was wrong with them. Now we have these materials, we have this technology that can last 75 or 100 or whatever it is. We're improving. We're doing a better job. The buildings we're thinking longer term. We're Think very much now about sustainability and energy consumption to build a really good envelope. And we know that if we build a passive house envelope or a really high performance envelope, it will pay for itself before your kids, if they're in kindergarten now, before they're out of high school, it will all be paid for. It won't be paid for energy anymore. So those are some of the equations of two. So is to put, the first thing that I said was to put an idea out because it's a lot easier to react to an idea than it is to react to just data. So that's why we tried to put the two options out, was to get a conversation going, get you thinking about what if we do, what if we do them in three phases, what if we do them in two phases? And the second is just to say that you guys really have done a great job and well beyond the ability to last well longer than when they originally decided what they thought they should be in 
everything that we're thinking about now for future facilities, we're thinking 50 years. So um, that's a big, big change in one generation to be able to think in terms of doubling the length of the, um, the life of those buildings. So, so that point that you're making, it occurred to me leaving the last discussion we had that many towns around here, I mean, Susanna did a great job um, end of last year of you know going around and collecting some examples of other communities that have built new buildings. But I, I, I just, as I was driving home from our last meeting, realized that like well, practically every town in the area is probably going to be facing this in the next decade because the, most of the buildings have all been built roughly around the same time. And there are a few outliers, but for the most part, most of the communities have grown up around the same um, sort of population growth trends and things like that, and they've, they've invested in their infrastructure in the same way. And I, I, I can imagine that in the next decade to 20 years, virtually every community is going to be looking at the same problem that we're looking at right now. I think you're right about that. There are some communities that have kept up by, um, we've been talking to Cumberland, for example, and you know they've built uh, their high school is a rambling thing, kind of like uh, the middle school in where it goes on and on and on forever. But they were rebuilt, they built in the middle school, they built in the elementary school now. So I think I, I'm in favor of this sort of phase approach because I think it's a big number, especially when you're going to pay for it. The voted, you know, the townspeople are going to pay for it, um, probably, because it would take too long to come up on the state's list. Um, but I think in that case, that that really favors uh, a phased approach, whether it's two phases or three phases. You know, because you can take your worst, which I think is the Pocco is the one that's in the worst condition, you could replace that elementary school. And then you really, like in terms of your debt, this, this the town's bonding ability, other debts get paid off and it frees up Ones like that. It'd be nice to see where where that is and when certain debt gets retired for the town. Timing phase two to come into play when some other debt is retired or something like that. There's there's another equation there where you can fit it in nicely and eventually just try and keep get ahead of it by tackling one uh, school building at a time. Now I think that goes back to Jamie's master plan, although it's not like the master plan you're thinking of, but a plan for the town about you know make, maybe stretching out that option one over a longer period of time and really identifying, okay, first we'll do this and we'll do this in about this year and then we'll do this in, in about this year. But coming out with a long range plan um, of how we're going to address this issue in the future for maybe I don't know how many years out. But. Yeah, and I mean, Marianne, you can probably speak to this better than I can because it was during your term of service or at least part of it. But it, I think the town went through that kind of about 15 or 20 years ago, starting 15 or 20 years ago, maybe with you know the new public works building, the new police department. That you know, was actually even before my time. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> uh, well, it was certainly before I was here. Hard but, to believe uh, that there was time before my time. <laughs> <laughs> but. Uh, you know, knowing that it wasn't like we were going to reconstruct all those things at the same time. Right, right. That, um, you know, that, that stuff would be, and even, you know, ongoing discussions that we have today around the retirement of some buildings at some point, you know, the buildings that we will no longer need at some point because we may change how a particular service is delivered or, or just not have that need for it anymore. So, I mean, other than the town hall, um, which of all of the buildings has the least, I, I would say, the least usage compared to the other departments. Um, you know, all, everything else on the municipal side has, has sort of already gone through that, but in a staggered way. Uh, very do you add anything to that? Or, no, come on. You know, I think talking about building three new schools at once is just a real idea. Yeah. <laughs> but I think if you say, well, we'll do this one first and then here's our plan for farther down and then farther along and this is how we're going to arrange this with the moving in and out or building in and taking down and moving athletic fields. I think I think the town would appreciate that, the work that might go into that and, and some kind of a long range plan. Just 
just want to add um, <clears throat> to what Jamie was saying that you know sooner or later some other school uh, districts will be in our shoes if they're not there already. And part of it will be driven by, I presume, part of it, for us it's been driven by, you know, our safety concerns first, and then, you know, boy, we're just not efficient, where there's all these old um, systems in place, and we need to we need to address all these things. But other other towns, I can imagine, they'll be they'll be thinking about those those issues that they may have. But I think as um, to the point of as new construction and uh, uh, other methods of being going to net zero become much more uh, dominant, that's going to be more of the driving force. Like, look how much we could save just by changing our school to this sort of uh, building material. I think the issues will still be there, but I think in, in the near future, the contrast between what it costs to run a building, build a building, and run a building that's that's um, uh, efficient or whatever, I forget the right word, passive, versus trying to beef up and support an older building. I think that contrast is going to be so stark, this is my prediction, that a lot of districts are going to go in that direction just based on money alone. Um, so my question is, um, are there any case examples out there, it doesn't have to be in Maine, where other schools have made that leap of faith? They have gone of, you know, traded in their own old building and built a brand new passive or net zero building so that it can, it can sh uh, serve as an example of how much can be saved financially in, the, in this transition. So I'm wondering if, if there are case examples to share in the future. There are. I mean, we've worked on some. So uh, and we probably should bring that as an illustration to the next meeting so we can show you before and after. Because we've had some situations where we had this exact same conversation. This building, you know, what if we added on here? What if we bumped out there? And what if we re-insulated it? You know, it's there. It's, you know, the embodied energy, all of those sorts of things. And um, over time, so we did a study, I don't know if you've showed them the work we did at the Wayne School, but they worked with the Wayne School for a long time. And they had an old elementary section, their, old, their lower school section was a collection of buildings. And about 10 years ago, we did a study showing them how they could add on to it. And it was going to be four different additions, and there, nothing really fit. It was kind of, you know, a, a joke about checking the, the code like that. It was one of those kinds of things where you tuck here, push out there, and everything. And we got it to work. And it was going to be X dollars. And then it came around. It went sort of on the list. They finally got to it on their list of projects. And we came back the next time, seven years had passed. And the world changed in the last seven years. Well, during those seven years, the world changed. So the climate change and all of the energy costs and everything became a much more dominant part of the equation. And that cut building was never going to be right. It was never going to, everything that we'd done was we'd make it workable of this renovation project, but then seven years later when it finally made it to the top of the list, it was going to cost not as much, but probably more than half as much as a new building. It was never going to be the right shape and size. It was old, old, old shapes of the building. You know, it was all of the things I mentioned before. And they made the decision to have us study a new building. <coughs> And what would the energy cost, what the cost of construction, and what would the energy cost savings be? And it was an easy decision. Which we laid out, worked with the teachers, did the schematic design, laid out the building, met their educational goals, their learning goals, their teaching goals. It, it was it was a purpose built building. Everything was the right size. It all fit, and the energy improvements were to be 80 percent better performance than energy code so 100% better than what uh, a building before the energy code was. Um, paid off in like seven years. So with time, this only gets better because I agree with you. I think that the equation is changing very rapidly. So energy costs are coming down. When we did our first net zero building, the botanical garden building, the education building up at the botanical gardens, 
costs four times as much for the solar panels for that building as it costs today. That was 10 years ago. So in the past 10 years, the cost of solar energy has gone down by 75%. It's a quarter of what it used to be. And that's just happening, it's continuing, because now there's a market for them, the cost of the panels is getting less and less all the time. The ways that you can buy, you know, the solar array change. You can, with power purchase money, you actually don't have to buy it. You can rent it and save energy costs and own it after 10 years. And there's lots of things happening, lots of innovations in terms of new materials and new technologies for buildings. We're building, we're building high rise buildings, 22 square buildings out of wood frame. Now, much more sustainable, sequestered carbon, all these kinds of things that really exist in this world. So I think that. You know, when you look at a timeline, it might spread out over 10, 15, maybe 20 years by the time you work your way through all the buildings. You've got a lot of change and a lot of innovation happening in that time. And I think it's happening in the classroom, too. There's a lot of innovation. Just the way teachers are thinking about it, the way students are thinking, the expectations of the community are, are changing. So the schools are kind of the heart, the heartbeat of the town. It's really important. It's a great investment. Everybody benefits. So. We're seeing it as, as engineers and architects as well. The, the state of New York just passed a really, really ambitious energy energy code. Um, Maine also has a, you know, an energy an energy code now as well. But um, we're seeing it at the state level. It's just really ambitious. We are going to make a state. And um, as Scott said, you know, before it was. The building code was structurally sound, and then a few energy crises, and suddenly we caught on. And now it's renewables, recycled materials, uh, tighter buildings, and uh, it's only going to get better. So, yeah. Other questions? Oh, I'm sorry. No. Scott has given us a lot to think about. Mm -hmm. it. If the high school has 10 or 15, Good years left. And someone just said that the Pond Cove school was in the worst condition. I wonder why one of the options wouldn't be to make that the number one priority of just leaving the high school where it is and not having all this moving around and, and deal with Pond Cove first if that's the biggest concern. Yeah, I think that's a good option. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, we just we just chose the high school because typically the high school is the flagship of the entire town. Um, usually, um, and as you're going through school and to go from a brand new school to then a 50-year-old building for your high school years before you go off to college, we just use that as an example. That that high school for say for option B being done first, it could easily be flip flop and be the K through eight building or the Pond Cove or elementary school, as with option one, with the program you get in that example, um, the elementary school and then the middle school were being addressed first. Again, these are just, these are examples, and the schedule in between the schools I'll point out as well. Like for option one, it shows it from year to year to year that something is going on. Um, you don't necessarily have to maintain it in that eight to ten year period. That could be an eight to fifteen year period. The format and the form of the process would remain the same. You would still have your 25% schematic design that you'd have to improve on to study what the whole building would cost. You would still have your two months of your your your, uh, your warrant meetings, your bonding meetings with the town council. Um, you would still have an 18-month build period to construct any new facility. I mean, there would still be temporary relocation of your athletic fields. We just showed that on a condensed schedule to show you what what it could be. If you wanted to start today, and there was a sense of urgency understanding earlier with yes, addressing the security issues, addressing other outstanding problems at both schools. So we provided, okay, if you really want to go and you want to put shovels in the ground as soon as possible, these are two examples of what that could look like. It also depends on what you think, um, you know, public opinion and support will be, you know, if, if you do your due diligence and determine that there might actually be more support for the new construction of the lower schools first ahead of the high school, then, you know, that'll be very telling and that'll be critical information to, to
to go ahead with. But you know, if, if you find that people feel like their kids are going to be out of you know the range of the new school by the time you get through the timeline for the first process, maybe they'd be more interested in seeing their high school happen. You know, it, it could go either way. Yes, sir. I'd like to make a couple of comments. Uh, Jamie, you mentioned about the requiring capacity at the time. But my response would be about requiring capacity. What's, it, it, it goes directly down to families and how much additional uh, cost can families bear to the families. So I think it comes down to the family. All the families have to be present in some way for this. And uh, last staff three to report the other night. I think there's about 300,000 square feet of building there. And my guess is it's at least 300 dollars a square foot. So we're talking 90 to over 100 million dollars. And how do you spread that amongst um, the residences in this town? Um, and my next question is, you know, if you go up and down the main coast, you go into Canada, Belfast, All these towns, specifically this town right here, if you drive around, you'll find that there are a lot of homes that are occupied through one side. They don't have kids in school. They're retiring up here or they're flying in here from New York City and Boston uh, for the weekend, and it's a great place to live. And so I'd like to know what the project, true projections are on the home, because it has been, I was told, most of the I think it's going to drop, drop dramatically in the next 10 years. And so I think everyone needs to assess the demographics in this town and assess what the enrollment truly would be, because I don't think it would be used to it. And so to spend, to think you're going to be renovating or um, occupying 300,000 square feet in a small town, I don't think so. Everyone in this room has to be really street smart and get the best people in New England, outside of this town, to assess what the real uh, demands will be in the schools. Student wise, you can't be Because people aren't going to be moving into this town to buy your home if they can't afford it. Tom, I just want to, what I, I, I totally agree with you that any dollar borrowed is a dollar that the taxpayers bear the burden of I'm not at all dismissing that. What I was simply iterating and to provide a little bit more color on is based on our schedule of debt existing that's retiring in combination with guidance that we've received from our own auditors that says, well, for a town this size with a budget this size, you have ceiling that you haven't hit yet. You can make judgments around whether or not you should use that or not. All I'm just saying is whether or not that's there. You, we're not in a position where we're up against the cap. No, that I, we, we don't have capacity to borrow. No, I, I didn't grasp it. Your, your, your second point, I think, is also well taken, but also a great unknown, because I think a, a similar argument could be made. You know, the, the Cape Elizabeth is one of, if not the oldest towns, average age-wise, in the state currently. So, um, you know, the, the, the school population has gotten to what it's gotten to, and I, I think is stabilized. Uh, over time now, um, but one could make the argument too that when a whole bunch of homes that are currently occupied by aging and empty nester families become available, are they more likely to be purchased by more empty nesters or more likely to be purchased by people with kids? And I think that's the big question that we don't have good forecasts on, um, but compared to a generation ago where those houses were turning over more quickly, and we were seeing those repeatable patterns of families moving in. Now, you know, I'll just use this example. You know, you've got you've got people that are staying in those houses longer and aren't turning them over. And I always, you know, a lot of people around this table have heard me make the tired example of my own in-laws who live around the corner from me and have a four-bedroom home that's sitting three bedrooms empty right now. Uh, it's not likely that 
another set of empty nesters is going to move into that, but they also don't have any place to leave it anytime soon. So, you know, that's that's sort of where the community is, and I think that's the big moving target that we don't have to do for sure. I think that makes planning very difficult. There must be some experts who could assess that. And then all you got to do is drive around Portland. The past three years has changed dramatically. And if you go south, and I don't get to the summer, and I realize what's happening, we're not in Boston. And, uh, people are commuting back and forth. They're coming up here, and as I said, I'm spending the summers here and leaving in North Florida. That's another huge issue is people leaving, changing their residences to Florida or other states. They're next to And it's people income level. Thank you. Uh, I don't necessarily agree with the democratic shifts that you're demographic shifts that you're talking about at all. Um, and in fact, anecdotally, what I see is really different. But that aside, there are huge costs to not doing this too. And I think our property values would be one of the first things to see them. I mean, I have a bigger investment than a dollar sign, but I think there's a big cost to not. Um, to, to creating something that's satisfactory, as mentioned earlier. I think we can do better than that, and I think the strength of our community has been based on that. And so I, I, I don't even want to pretend for a second that that's not a big um, piece of what's creating a successful community in the value. I also think, I think it's important for us to be cognizant of people's financial concerns, and I think you make some good points that we should be keeping that in mind. But Having gone through the whole comprehensive plan recently and seeing what people value, I think there may also be a lot of community members who would be willing to pay more to see certain returns on their investment, like um, like energy savings, and you know just having more green buildings and having that that um, good conscience from knowing that we're doing good. And there are also people who maybe would put a higher dollar value on a better space to have students educated in. So we can't, we do need to consider the numbers, but I think we should also be considering that the numbers don't say everything. If I could sort of um, see what's happening here, which I think is a really good thing. I think the Scott's pointer, whether you think it was throwing some spaghetti on the wall or just saying, hey, here's an option to you. We're starting to, if we can gather the numbers of what the town's bonding capacity is, that's one sort of boundary on this equation, right? If we can understand what the, we believe the demographic to be, that will be another boundary. If we have an opinion of how long these schools can produce good students without costing us a lot of money in, in operations and maintenance repairs. We can make an assessment of how long we think the payback is on a super energy efficient school. Those boundaries are starting to come just with this conversation. At the last meeting, I mentioned if everybody wrote down, <clears throat> excuse me, sorry, if everybody wrote down ten things that you think are the most important to this town kind of demographics, energy efficiency, bonding capacity, how much we're taxing each resident. What are those 10 things? And then discuss them amongst yourselves and use that as the filter. Um, as James said, one of the things we heard at the last meeting was the sense of urgency. So one of the things that drove us to these two options was, well, this will get you into, this will get you into new schools before your old schools hit that end of life where the cost of staying in them is, is going to be very high. Um, you're, I, I love, what you've said and a couple other folks about making a statement about energy efficiency and, and, and the kind of buildings you're gonna you're gonna live in and work in in this town. What kind of student does that send out into the into the world today? Um, was it my buildings were satisfactory or oh my gosh if you build this it pays for itself and it lasts a long time. You know, what kind of message is that for the students? If that's a strong thing for you that goes on your list of ten things. Again, I think a lot of good discussion and the boundaries are starting to, to 
come around this equation in a good way. Susanna? This one, um, about, I'm so glad you brought up the comprehensive plan, um, because I, I really think you know, that's got to be part of this discussion. Um, I was on the committee, I can't remember all the numbers, but to your point of um, you know, sustainable, we want to be having a more sustainable town focus, and then the, um, the large number of um, community members who do support better schools, renovated schools. Those are both really big, especially the school, were really big numbers on the comprehensive plan um, in polling. And I, I think, you know, it, we, have, we have to, we have to pay attention to the, the comprehensive plan as it moves forward. And, and from my experience and my recollection on the, the committee for two years, having better schools, supporting schools that have been improved for, for efficiency and safety was greatly supported by the community. What are your thoughts about, you said you might have figures um, about energy comparisons for next time. What are your thoughts about information that you would share with us? something ahead of time to come prepared with more with, with questions and we can discuss that rather than spending time to go over it at the very beginning and continue that discussion. Um, that way everybody every everybody comes comes armed with more information. Um, if that would be if that would be satisfactory for you folks. We'll we'll look at the numbers as far as energy consumption, water, electrical, uh, electricity, oil. Um, issues that we've discovered throughout the needs assessment process and try to pit them against what uh, maintenance cost would be for similarly square footage buildings with brand new systems in place and try to look at what that, you know, turn this apples to oranges into more of apples and apples. So will you be looking at similar square footage? What? I mean, there, and, that's, and that's the issue is uh, the, the, the big question is, you know, how large are we looking at for a size building? Um, I think for this, for this exercise, we would maintain square footage is exactly the same yeah. for what the buildings are now because that is what we know. Um, it'd be hard to take existing data and apply it to a different size building. It just it wouldn't that'd be your apples and oranges scenario. We can, we can add some trends. If classrooms are trending a little bit smaller, gathering spaces are a little bit larger, we can add some factors to those to try to right size things based on, a, you know, square feet per student kind of thing. Uh, sorry, some, some data there. And, uh, yeah. What other information on the Could we add in also based on historical data that you can gather uh, what the cost per square foot to do any anything, whether it be renovation or new construction, how that would increase over time? Escalation? Yeah. Because mm -hmm. I, you know, we're at a point now that we've got to do something, and uh, you know, we all know that something needs to be done, but how does that price look as we stretch it out over a timeline? Right, and, and you make a very good point, and also the point Jamie brought up at um, the last month or so is that the borrowing <coughs> interest is near zero percent interest for borrowing at this point. And, Everybody keeps talking about how the market is going to fall into a recession soon. People have been discussing it for the past year or so. But we don't know when that's going to hit, if it's going to hit at all within the next five years. We just don't know. 
So there's some there's some speculative data that we just have that we'll have to use for that. But um, looking at it from what you would spend today and trying to estimate what you would spend tomorrow, we can sort of take a look at. It's all speculation at this point. Right. But would um, <clears throat> would we be able to have the data on whether it is even feasible for the Pompano Middle School students to inhabit the high school building yeah. by the next meeting? Because I think. Um, I love the idea of having that conversation, and I, I really appreciate that conversation. Um, and I think that knowing that it's even feasible needs to be, <laughs> we, we can't really go forward with that conversation. Yeah, and, and we would have to use our population now. Right, we couldn't. <laughs> and we know what that is. We know what that is. Yeah. So we know your population now. We do know that the high school is bigger um, on a square footage basis than the existing car program. go and determine what makes up that square footage, what amount of it is classroom space right. versus lecture space versus science labs, you know, so or what might currently, or cafeteria space, what might currently be a science lab in the high school probably would be renovated to be something different uh, or, you know, altered significantly in some way, even just from the consideration of the different sizes uh, of the change in population, if that school is being renovated to accommodate the elementary school and middle school. So uh, there's actually quite a lot to look at. Um, what I understand, but is it? I think layers. the committee needs to know: is it even feasible? Yeah, it, even so, though it's just an estimate, because we know that we're basically one third, one third, one third, and so how do you take two thirds and move it into one third? Looking exactly. at it right now, right. So. yeah, and and understanding that it might not be as precise as possible. I think totally. Point James, point James, point James point <coughs> we should. I've noted that I think we should carry forward is you know, we have two red dots here, you know, more, very close to each other. In a, in a perfect scenario, we do a build that doesn't waste a lot of money, has a really great payback. It turns out the most incredible students and has the next time that this committee, whether it's our kids or grandkids or whoever else, that those two dots are quite quite as far apart as they can be. Because the next build, um, to your point about escalation, is likely to cost even more. And I think it's a duty to, down the road, if we can get them separated, even if it was by 15 years, it would That's be ideal. That's why we can grade. talk about that master plan and kind of spread it out a bit, maybe. Well, and I think the, the intent of this timeline was to show you sort of the absolute quickest we right. could ever recommend you consider undertaking this effort in, and, and so I, I think from there on out, it can... You can, you can expand that. It take, right. take the same format right. of repla replacing each of the schools and just insert time in between to stretch out the process. Um, similarly with either option A or B, one or two, rather. Right. I, think, I, I think we should have a little better handle around what the costs look like. I mean, people just threw out $100 million here just as a, a rough number. I think it might be interesting, Jamie, to see if you know, Matt's team could model some what the cost to the average resident you know, taxpayer would be or X period of time um, just to see where the, where the curve looks and um, how far out we have to go. Something tells me you can't build three buildings for $100 million, even if you take it out 15 years. I mean, completely. Will we'll, we'll school buildings cost for, this, for the size of population that we have? More well, or less. Right. It's, it, and then the difficulty in answering that question is really a lot of it is also the earthwork in the site. You have, you have a field here. If you were to go in the center between the two schools there, it's a significant amount of earth that you have to bring into the level that entire area, and that is a significant cost. Whereas if you go to Falmouth and Cumberland, they're building on more or less even terrain, so to speak. Um, so those, those are significant cost factors that are flushed out in the 25% design. Um, it's difficult to you know, you hire your, so your, uh, your geotech, your surveyors, to really go through, analyze what the soil is, and how much will it compact once you put an actual building on top of that. Um, so there are, those are the, 
a lot of those factors are, are, coming, in, are coming into play, which is why we've been hesitant to necessarily just throw out a number. As you know, once, once a number is thrown out, that's the number that sticks with you for the entire process. And we're very careful. What, we, what we do have is what Susan put together. Right. Oh, just the, the, the benchmarks of other communities. Oh, okay, so we don't know what the variables were that like okay. James just mentioned as to what went into that, but we certainly at least have a list of this is a school that was built, this is how much it cost, and in some cases, this is how much the state yeah. kicked in on it. Maybe right. we could revisit that yeah. list. Right, and I think that's in Appendix G of the assessment, the, the comparison. Thanks to Susanna for research, looking at you know, the schools in the area, and a few schools are looking at uh, building new as well, South Portland, New York, for instance. There are some that we captured the numbers that they had initially published in the paper, um, but that information is going to give you a general idea of, of, of the scale. And Frankly, you know, it, it would be an interesting exercise too. You know, we, we didn't talk about this today, but last time we met, we said you could just continue to maintain your buildings exactly as you are. So if you're going to be doing an analysis of what the taxpayer is paying um, when you're considering the cost of what a new building would be, it would be interesting to also, you know, say you're looking at 20 years, 30 years, in that same time period, what is the cost to simply maintain it as it is? With all of your maintenance and operations and all the repairs that are required. Yeah, that's we know that's twenty million in floors. Stopping the floors, right? That's One point two years. Yeah. 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 Right. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I, I mean, I think that's the point we brought up about we don't have, even in today's world, what our current cost of operation is um, to make that comparison. So. I, just, I was going to stick my neck out here a little bit. <laughs> and maybe maybe Colby and, and Scott Simons can prove me wrong, but I, I honestly don't think we can renovate the high school without some type of addition. Uh, one of the things that sparked this whole conversation and starting the ball rolling Sorry. was the fact that we only had one auditorium and one cafeteria at the middle school. Uh, we would be going from that to the same situation here right now and adding in the fact that we only have one gym here where we have two over there. And just based on my knowledge of walking through the buildings, I continually meet with Troy and Jason Jeff as well. We're always kind of trying to make the best of the space that we have available. And just the amount of rooms, the amount of offices, the one-on-one -on -one spaces that are required by special ed, and everything put together, I don't really see it happening. So I think we're looking at a renovation to a building and an addition. And to me, that's a, a, a huge financial commitment. So I'm just throwing it out. Um, just a conclusion, but for a wrap up, I know you've been taking a lot of questions down, and a lot of people have asked questions that may not have been answered, and people may still have more questions. So if you can uh, type those up and send it to Susanna, and she's going to share with us. So anything we don't see there, we can add to it. So the next meeting will be a little bit more prepared than what it has been with more data collection. Yeah, I think the plan is to. I, I took pretty good notes at the last meeting, and I promise you we are working on those financial, the financial and, and the other questions that were asked. <coughs> the information that we've been asked to pull to tonight is try to get it to you in two weeks so that you have two more weeks to work on it, and you'll have a wonderful Thanksgiving holiday with all mm -hmm. that time at home to, to really dive into the numbers and look at it so we can all get together in December and really, really sort of see if we can get some really good boundaries around it and something that you really like. So. You could give us two weeks, that'd be fantastic. Well, thank you very much. Thank you everyone for coming. And, uh